if that's a fun fact, but I've threatened my wife every time that I'm going to take a break off and go be a ski bum for a very long time. Um, she doesn't believe me. There we go. Okay, so make money, drive adoption. That's what we're talking about here, right? So there's three of us, uh, attorneys across the country. I'm in uh, Houston and New York, and uh, my other colleagues are in Florida. And Joe, where are you? Uh, Virginia. So we're all, we're all spread out. But we're going to have uh, separate topics to discuss with you. Um, my first topic is about how to make money, where I think uh, this is a really great area for expansion of telehealth. Um, and then my second topic is about people who really want to make money and abused it. So um, there's uh, some fun facts here. So government driving change. Now we all know that that has significant implications. The government can be a great um, driver of change. And I quote for you uh, the CMS administrators' uh, recent comments at the American Hospitals Association, um, which I, I highlight because I believe that it shows the government really is at least this administration is really pushing towards adoption of and utilization of technology and anything else that can drive better care. Uh, obviously, the value-based payments, uh, this, that structure and that concept is what they've been pushing for. Uh, in fact, they are tasked now with restructuring what I will be talking about is anti-kickback, Stark laws, those things that everyone says um, restricts uh, innovation and, and growth. Uh, they're working right now as we speak on changing uh, those laws, and we'll see how they play out. Uh, but, you know, some quotes about that, and obviously you can read, so we'll go through that. But these are the things that they have been doing over time, specific with telehealth and utilization of the technology, working with providers uh, and giving them opportunities to provide better care, uh, expanding programs where we all know the definition of telehealth services for at least the Medicare traditional Part B program is limited um, by, those, by those characteristics of geography, modality, providers, and the like. Um, what I really want to talk about, because I only got 10 minutes to talk, and attorneys can talk fast or really, really slow, so I'll talk fast, the, is the Medicare Advantage plans, the final rules that came out, and what uh, we're going to be seeing is the possibility that in Jul on January 1 um, of 2020 is that Medicare Advantage plans have great flexibility to start covering telehealth services and technology as they want. I think it's about more than a third of the Medicare population is now uh, in, enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan. Our friends from Humana carry the majority of that business, and they continue, and I know, they continue to see that to be expanding. So do all the other payers. So if they have the ability to cover a significant population in Medicare, um, why do I think that this is the next big thing? Well, the next big thing is because CMS has now said, okay, Medicare Advantage plans, you have your basic benefits packages, everything that's covered under Part B, but we're going to allow you now to cover additional telehealth services. And um, there's a definition, of course, there's always a definition and caveats to what that means. Um, but if it doesn't fall into an additional telehealth services in that category, you can still cover it under supplemental benefits. You basically can cover whatever you want and you just charge people for it. Here's the definition. Um, and what I what it says is basically anything uh, within Part B we already know is, our, is on a basic benefit has to be covered. This now says anything that you can provide in person under Part B can now be covered. And it's, if it's not payable because of all the geographic modality um, you know, type of providers, throw it out the window. You can cover it if you want. And you, Medicare Advantage plan, you determine whether it's clinically appropriate. We're not going to do it. In fact, they go so far as to say, we're not even going to provide much of a definition of technology because we want innovation. We want you, Medicare Advantage plans, to cover the, whatever you think is clinically appropriate. Um, what does that mean? That opens the door for great possibilities, not just providers and suppliers of the services, but tech companies, too. I have tech companies. We can walk into the door uh, and get meetings with Medicare Advantage plans and medical directors and say, we have a product that we know your providers are going to benefit from. We have a product that's going to reduce your costs. And this is the way that we otherwise can structure those deals. Now, getting in the door and having those conversations is pretty hard. But it still is an opportunity to um, expand upon and use the platform to say, oh, no, no, you're not restricted. 
you can make whatever decision you want of what is clinically appropriate. Let's have a conversation. Let's show you the analytics, and let's really use this. And that's why I think it's such a big area for, for expansion. Um, now, of course, there are still some coverage requirements. It must be delivered by a network provider. OK, well, that's fine. Um, but you know, in some instances, that means you've got to get into the door, and, you, and the providers that you're working with and utilizing the technology or providing the service do have to be uh, within that network. That just simply means the Medicare Advantage is plans willing to contract with them as network providers. The beneficiary's right to choose, that's good, right? I can either do in-person or this new technology. So there is that patient choice that still applies. And the termination of clinically appropriate um, and notice to the beneficiaries is the in advance. I think this is probably the biggest limitation because it's going to say prior to each fiscal year, you medical, you know, you MA plans need to decide what you think is clinically appropriate, publish it, and then and only then is it covered. And why that's a restriction is because the MA plans have to report to the government and do the, and the cost reports and, and con conceptually to get reimbursed for it, right? To say, hey, we are going to start to cover this. And this is going to be part of the financials that we, that we provide to you. And it's going to have an impact on how much uh, the government's going to cover and pay. So there's a balance there. But every year is sort of an opportunity while this, while this is in play. And this isn't a demonstration project. This isn't short term. This is a final rule. This is, this is how it's going to work out. OK, I probably only have no minutes. But fraud and abuse. We went from how you can make money in the future to how people really made some crazy amounts of money. Um, oh, I forgot. These are advisory opinions. OK, so this is fun stuff. Um, this is, again, government uh, innovation, right? So fraud and abuse, anti-kickback statute, Stark, they're all designed to avoid overutilization, all, all designed to avoid the provision of medically unnecessary services, uh, and it's a construct that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. Oh, good, I have three minutes. The, uh, and so we have a number of advisory opinions where the government has come out and said, all right, we, knew, we know that technology is necessary for, you know, for you know, the adoption of technology is necessary to provide these services, to connect individuals in you know, remote areas, even for Medicare services, and then down the line for Medicaid as those are broader programs. And we're going to approve um, certain, you know, you can submit a request in to say, is this kosher? Can we do this? Is this going to be in compliance with the law? And these advisory opinions um, are examples, historic ones, uh, more recent ones, where the OIG has come out and approved limited, um, and, and it just gives us a, a window into what's probably further appropriate and, and permitted. But in this case, for the 2019, you know, the approval of a loan uh, of a smartphone to those who are in need of the technology to do the sensor, um, to have the information then fed back uh, to, to the to prescribing physician for medication. The other one uh, was an example of a situation where Interestingly enough, the distant sites providing the technology necessary to the originating site with a patient at a clinic, and uh, they're providing all the equipment and everything necessary. And previously, the government said, "Well, we don't want to, you know, provide anything that was actually going to increase use or overutilization." But this opinion came out and said, "Even though you're going to give them the technology, even though it's going to create services that we're going to have to cover that we probably wouldn't have been able to cover in unless they made, you know, the trek." out there, we still think it's appropriate, we're still going to permit, permit it, and even though the clinic's going to be able to build a facility fee, we're still okay with it. So that's an increase in costs to the program that they're okay with for in, in promoting care and promoting access to services, which is a great sign. So this is just something that shows the common themes between the advisory opinions and the arrangements, and it's no reason to, to repeat it. I mean, you have the slides to look at. Here's the fraud. Um, Operation Brace Yourself, uh, and then, uh, then there's a, 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 you know, a, a Operation Double Helix. So what's happening here? Uh, telehealth is being used, and actually Ingrid had a great slide where it showed the Venn diagram with uh, telehealth, the provider and the vendor, and, and all of them sort of working, and then right smack dab in the middle. Well, think about... <laughs> being right smack in the dab in the middle, and you're all three of those entities. You are the one who's controlling the ordering of the test services, or the DME, or the compound pharmacy. You're the one who's directing where those go. You're the one who's deciding who fills it, and you're the one dropping the claim. And you're the one out there promoting and distributing. That, that's what basically happened in these situations. We have 
some of the largest Medicare fraud schemes in history, 1.2 billion, and the most recent that dropped on Friday with 36 some odd indictments, um, uh, 2.1 billion dollars. We're talking CGX, PGX, genetic testing, high reimbursement. Um, we're talking, in this case, for Operation Brace Yourself was um, I, the DME was the uh, braces uh, from China that were basically sent to people who had no need for it. I mean, just some significant issues at, at play here and significant dollars. So, you know, we're dealing with a situation where to incentivize people to be within the program, there's payment in 30 days. The pay and chase concept is, is, um, is, is what happens here. So we have that one and we have the, the $2.1 million fraud. These are things that give telehealth, unfortunately, a bad name, um, things that we're having to deal with, but uh, they're important for you to understand that exists there, and that's what the government's looking at. So I will turn it over to...